Ancient civilizations the world over believed Earth to be the flat, immovable center of the universe around which the heavens revolved daily cycles in perfect circles. This stable geocentric universe, proven true by experience and experiments, which reigned undisputed for thousands of years, adequately explaining all earthly and celestial phenomena, was violently uprooted, spun around, and sent flying through infinite space by a cabal of sun-worshipping theoretical astronomers. Early Masonic magicians like Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton, along with their modern Masonic astronaut counterparts like Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins, hand in hand with NASA and world Freemasonry, have pulled off the greatest hoax, propagated the most phenomenal lie, and perpetuated the most complete indoctrination in history. Over the course of 500 years, using everything from books, magazines, and television to computer-generated imaging, a multi-generational conspiracy has succeeded in the minds of the masses to pick up the fixed earth, shape it into a ball, spin it in circles, and throw it around the sun. In schools where every professor's desk is adorned with a spinning earth globe, we are lectured on the heliocentric theory of the universe, shown images of ball planets, and videos of men suspended in space. The illusion created, connivingly convincing, has entranced the world's population into blindly believing a maleficent myth. The greatest cover-up of all time, NASA and Freemasonry's biggest secret, is that we are living on a plane, not a planet that Earth is the flat, stationary center of the universe. Lady Blunt wrote, We are told that though the Earth has the appearance of being a vast plane, with the sun moving high above and over the Earth, that what we see is a deception, it is an optical illusion, for it is not the sun that moves, but the Earth, with the sea and all that in them is, in the form of a globe, whizzing with terrific rapidity round the sun, located millions of miles away, its mean distance being assumed to be 91 millions of miles, and that the Earth travels at a rate of 68,000 miles an hour, or 19 miles every second. Alan Dave said, If the government or NASA had said to you that the Earth is stationary, imagine that. And then imagine we are trying to convince people that no, no, it's not stationary. It's moving forward at 32 times rifle bullet speed and spinning at a thousand miles per hour. We would be laughed at. We would have so many people telling us, you are crazy. The Earth's not moving. We would be ridiculed for having no scientific backing for this convoluted moving Earth theory. And not only that, but then people would say, Oh, then how do you explain a fixed calm atmosphere and the sun's observable movement? How do you explain that? Imagine saying to people, No, no, the atmosphere is moving also, but is somehow magically velcroed to the moving Earth. The reason is not simply because the Earth is stationary. So, what we are actually doing is what makes sense. We are saying that the moving Earth theory is nonsense. The stationary Earth theory makes sense, and we are being ridiculed. You've got to picture it being the other way around to realize just how ridiculous this situation is. This theory from the government and NASA that the Earth is rotating and orbiting and leaning over and wobbling is absolute nonsense, and yet people are clinging to it tightly, like a teddy bear. They just can't bring themselves to face the possibility that the Earth is stationary, though all the evidence shows it, we feel no movement, the atmosphere hasn't been blown away, we see the sun move from east to west. Everything can be explained by a motionless earth without bringing in all these assumptions to cover up previous assumptions gone bad. If the earth were truly a spinning ball orbiting the sun, there are several tests and experiments which could be and have been conducted to prove or disprove the veracity of such a claim. For example, Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe famously argued against the heliocentric theory in his time, positing that if the Earth revolved in an orbit around the Sun, the change in relative position of the stars after six months of orbital motion could not fail to be seen. He argued that the stars should seem to separate as we approach and come together as we recede. 
In actual fact, however, almost 200 million miles of supposed orbit around the sun, and not a single inch of parallax can be detected in the stars. Thomas Winship wrote, If the Earth is at a given point in space on, say, January 1st, and according to present-day science, at a distance of 190 million miles from that point six months afterwards, it follows that the relative position and directions of the stars will have greatly changed, however small the angle of parallax may be. That this great change is nowhere apparent and has never been observed incontestably proves that the Earth is at rest that it does not move in an orbit round the sun. Samuel Robotham wrote, Take two carefully bored metallic tubes, not less than six feet in length, and place them one yard asunder, on the opposite sides of a wooden frame, or a solid block of wood or stone. So adjust them that their centers of axes of vision shall be perfectly parallel to each other. Now direct them to the plane of some notable fixed star a few seconds previous to its meridian time. Let an observer be stationed at each tube, and the moment the star appears in the first tube, let a loud knock or other signal be given, to be repeated by the observer at the second tube when he first sees the same star. A distinct period of time will elapse between the signals given. The signals will follow each other in very rapid succession but still the time between is sufficient to show that the same star is not visible at the same moment by two parallel lines of sight when only one yard asunder. A slight inclination of the second tube towards the first tube would be required for the star to be seen through both tubes at the same instant. Let the tubes remain in their position for six months, at the end of which time the same observation or experiment will produce the same results. The star will be visible at the same meridian time without the slightest alteration being required in the direction of the tubes, from which it is concluded that if the Earth had moved one single yard in an orbit through space, there would at least be observed the slight inclination of the tube which the difference in position of one yard had previously required. But as no such difference in the direction of the tube is required, the conclusion is unavoidable that in six months a given meridian upon the Earth's surface does not move a single yard, and therefore that the Earth has not the slightest degree of orbital motion. When Tycho Brahe demonstrated that after 190 million miles of supposed orbit around the Sun, not a single inch of parallax could be detected, desperate heliocentrists, instead of conceding, doubled down, claiming the stars were all actually trillions upon trillions of miles away from us, so distant that no appreciable parallax could ever be detected. This convenient explanation, which heliocentrists have clung to for centuries, has proven satisfactory to silence the uninquisitive minds of the masses, but still fails to adequately address many observable phenomena, such as our wildly implausible synchronization with Polaris. William Carpenter wrote, the idea that the Earth, if it were a globe, could possibly move in an orbit of hundreds of millions of miles with such exactitude that the crosshairs in a telescope fixed on its surface would appear to glide gently over a star millions of millions of miles away is simply monstrous, whereas with a fixed telescope it matters not the distance of the stars, though we suppose them to be as far off as the astronomer supposes them to be, for, as Mr. Richard Proctor himself says, the further away they are, the less they will seem to shift. Why, in the name of common sense, should observers have to fix their telescopes on solid stone bases so that they should not move a hair's breadth if the earth on which they fix them moves at the rate of 19 miles in a second? Indeed, to believe that Mr. Proctor's mass of 6,000 million 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 tons is rolling, surging, flying, darting on through space forever, with a velocity compared with which a shot from a cannon is a very slow coach, with such unerring accuracy that a telescope fixed on granite pillars in an observatory will not enable a lynx-eyed astronomer to detect a variation in its onward motion of the thousandth part of a hair's breadth, is to conceive a miracle compared with which all the miracles on record put together would sink into utter insignificance. Captain R. J. Morrison, the late compiler of Zadkiel's Almanac, says, We declare that this motion is all mere bosh, and that the arguments which uphold it are, when examined with an eye that seeks for truth, mere nonsense and childish absurdity. 
Another experiment repeatedly performed to disprove Earth's supposed rotation under our feet is firing cannonballs vertically and horizontally in all cardinal directions. If the Earth were truly spinning eastwards underneath us, as the heliocentric model suggests, then vertically fired cannonballs should fall significantly due west. In actual fact, though, whenever this has been tested, vertically fired cannonballs perfectly aimed with a plumb line, lit with a slow match, shoot upwards an average of 14 seconds ascending, 14 seconds descending, and fall back to the ground no more than two feet away from the cannon sometimes directly back into the muzzle. If the Earth were actually spinning at the supposed rate of 600 to 700 miles per hour at the mid-latitudes of England and America, where the tests have been performed, the cannonballs should fall a full 8,400 feet, or over a mile and a half, behind the cannon. Again, at this point, instead of conceding, desperate heliocentrists triple down, claiming the reason cannonballs fall straight back is because the magical properties of gravity allow Earth to somehow drag the entire lower atmosphere in perfect synchronization with its axial spin, rendering even such breakneck speeds completely unnoticeable to the observer and unmeasurable by experimentation. This highly implausible, though clever and convenient explanation, only holds for vertically fired cannons, however. If cannons are instead fired and measured in all cardinal directions, even the heliocentrist's atmospheric velcro trump card becomes unplayable. North-south firing cannonballs establish a control, then east firing cannonballs should fall significantly farther than all others, and west firing cannonballs should fall significantly closer due to the supposed thousand mile per hour eastward rotation of the earth. In actual fact, however, regardless of which direction cannons are fired, north, south, east, or west, the distance covered is always the same. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, When sitting in a rapidly moving railway carriage, let a spring gun be fired forward, or in the direction in which the train is moving. Again, let the same gun be fired, but in the opposite direction, and it will be found that the ball or other projectile will always go farther in the first case than in the latter. If a person leaps backward from a horse in full gallop, he cannot jump so great a distance as he can by jumping forward. Leaping from a moving sledge, coach, or other object backwards or forwards, the same results are experienced. Many other practical cases could be cited to show that any body projected from another body in motion does not exhibit the same behavior as it does when projected from a body at rest. Nor are the results the same when projected in the same direction as that in which the body moves, as when projected in the opposite direction, because, in the former case, the projected body receives its momentum from the projectile force plus that given to it by the moving body, and in the latter case, this momentum minus that of the moving body. Hence, it would be found that if the Earth is moving rapidly from west to east, a cannon fired in due easterly direction would send a ball to a greater distance than it would if fired in a due westerly direction. But the most experienced artillerymen, many of whom have had great practice both at home and abroad, in almost every latitude, have declared that no difference whatsoever is observable, that in charging and pointing their guns, no difference in the working is ever required. Gunners in warships have noticed a considerable difference in the results of their firing from guns at the bow when sailing rapidly toward the object fired at, and when firing from guns placed at the stern while sailing away from the object, and in both cases the results are different to those observed when firing from a ship at perfect rest. These details of practical experience are utterly incompatible with the supposition of a revolving earth. William Carpenter wrote, it is in evidence that, if a projectile be fired from a rapidly moving body in an opposite direction to that in which the body is going, it will fall short of the distance at which it would reach the ground if fired in the direction of motion. Now since the earth is said to move at the rate of 19 miles in a second of time from east to west, it would make all the difference imaginable if the gun were fired in an opposite direction. But as, in practice, there is not the slightest difference whichever way the thing may be done, we have a forcible overthrow of all the fancies relative to the motion of the earth. During the Crimean War, the subject of artillery fire in connection with the earth's rotation became a hotly discussed topic among military men, scientists, philosophers, and statesmen. Around this time, on December 20th, 1857, 
British Prime Minister Lord Palmerston wrote to the Secretary of War, Lord Panmure, stating, There is an investigation which it would be important, and at the same time easy to make, and that is, whether the rotation of the earth on its axis has any effect on the curve of a cannonball in its flight. One should suppose that it has, and that while the cannonball is flying in the air, impelled by the gunpowder, in a straight line from the cannon's mouth, the ball would not follow the rotation of the earth in the same manner which it would if lying at rest on the earth's surface. If this be so, a ball fired in the meridional direction, that is to say due south or due north, ought to deviate to the west of the object at which it was aimed, because during the time of flight that object will have gone to the east somewhat faster than the cannonball will have done. The trial might be easily made in any place in which a free circle of a mile or more radius could be obtained, and a cannon placed in the center of that circle, and fired alternately north, south, east, and west, with equal charges, would afford the means of ascertaining whether each shot flew the same distance or not. Several such experiments have since been performed and shown that projectiles fired in various directions on Earth's surface always cover comparable distances with no appreciable difference whatsoever. These results are entirely against the theory of a rotating, revolving world, and serve as direct empirical evidence for the stationary Earth. More evidence, similar to the cannonball experiment, is found in helicopters and airplanes. If the Earth were spinning several hundred miles per hour beneath our feet, helicopter pilots and hot air balloonists should be able to simply ascend straight up hover and wait for their lateral destinations to reach them. Since such a thing has never happened in the history of aeronautics, however, haughty heliocentrists must once again rely on Newton's magical atmospheric velcro, claiming the lower atmosphere, up to an undetermined height, somewhere above the reach of helicopters, hot air balloons, and anything not built by NASA, is pulled perfectly along with the rotating Earth, rendering such experiments moot. Granting heliocentrists their atmospheric glue supposition helps them dismiss the results of vertically fired cannonball experiments, but does not and cannot help them explain away the results of horizontal cardinally fired cannonballs. Similarly, granting them their magic velcro helps dismiss the results of hovering helicopter and hot air balloon experiments, but does not and cannot explain away the results of airplanes flying in cardinal directions. For instance, if both the Earth and its lower atmosphere are supposedly rotating together eastwards 1,038 miles per hour at the equator, then airplane pilots would need to make an extra 1,038 mile per hour compensation acceleration when flying westwards. North and southbound pilots would by necessity have to set diagonal courses to compensate. Since no such compensations are ever necessary, except in the imaginations of astronomers, it follows that the Earth does not move. Gabrielle Henriette wrote, If flying had been invented at the time of Copernicus, there is no doubt that he would have soon realized that his contention regarding the rotation of the Earth was wrong, on account of the relation existing between the speed of an aircraft and that of the Earth's rotation. The distance covered by an aircraft would be reduced or increased by the speed of the rotation according to whether such aircraft traveled in the same direction or against it. Thus, if the earth rotates, as it is said, at a thousand miles an hour, and a plane flies in the same direction at only five hundred miles, it is obvious that its place of destination will be farther removed every minute. On the other hand, if flying took place in the direction opposite to that of the rotation, a distance of 1,500 miles would be covered in one hour, instead of 500, since the speed of the rotation is to be added to that of the plane. It could also be pointed out that such a flying speed of 1,000 miles an hour, which is supposed to be that of the Earth's rotation, has recently been achieved, so that an aircraft flying at this rate in the same direction as that of the rotation could not cover any ground at all. It would remain suspended in mid-air over the spot from which it took off. Since both speeds are equal, there would, in addition, be no need to fly from one place to another, situated on the same latitude. The aircraft could just rise and wait for the desired country to arrive in the ordinary course of the rotation, and then land. The heliocentric theory, literally flying in the face of direct observation, experimental evidence, and common sense, 
maintains that the ball earth is spinning around its axis at a thousand miles per hour, revolving around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour, while the entire solar system rotates around the Milky Way galaxy at 500,000 miles per hour, and the Milky Way speeds through the ever-expanding universe at over 670 million miles per hour, yet no one in history has ever felt a thing. We can feel the slightest breeze on a summer's day, but never one iota of air displacement from these incredible speeds. Heliocentrists claim with a straight face that their ball Earth spins at a constant velocity, dragging the atmosphere in such a manner as to perfectly cancel all centrifugal, gravitational, and inertial forces, so we do not feel the tiniest bit of motion, perturbation, wind, or air resistance. Such backpedaling, damage-control, reverse-engineered explanations certainly stretch the limits of credibility in the imagination, leaving much to be desired by discerning minds. David Wardlaw Scott wrote, Dear reader, do you feel the motion? I trow not, for if you did, you would not so quietly be reading my book. I doubt not you have been, like myself, on a railway platform when an express train rushed wildly past at the rate of 65 miles per hour, when the concussion of the air almost knocked you down. But how much more terrible would be the shock of the Earth's calculated motion 1,000 times faster than the speed of the railway express? Thomas Winship wrote, Let imagination picture to the mind what force air would have which was set in motion by a spherical body of 8,000 miles in diameter, which in one hour was spinning round 1,000 miles per hour, rushing through space at 65,000 miles per hour and gyrating across the heavens. Then let conjecture endeavor to discover whether the inhabitants on such a globe could keep their hair on. If the earth globe rotates on its axis at the terrific rate of a thousand miles per hour, such an immense mass would of necessity cause a tremendous rush of wind in the space it occupied. The wind would go all one way and anything like clouds which got within the sphere of influence of the rotating sphere would have to go the same way. The fact that the Earth is at rest is proved by kite flying. If the Earth and atmosphere are constantly revolving eastwards at a thousand miles per hour, how is it that clouds, wind, and weather patterns casually and unpredictably go every which way, often traveling in opposing directions simultaneously? Why can we feel the slightest westward breeze but not the Earth's incredible supposed 1,000 mile per hour eastward spin? And how is it that the magic Velcro of gravity is strong enough to drag miles of Earth's atmosphere along, but weak enough to allow little bugs, birds, clouds, and planes to travel freely unabated in any direction? David Wardlaw Scott wrote, What about the lark which, at early morn, soars aloft, trilling its lays of luscious melody? Why was it not swept away in the tumultuous atmosphere, but it still continues singing in happy ignorance of any commotion in the heavens? Who has not noticed on a calm summer day the thistle-down floating listlessly in the air and the smoke ascending straight as an arrow from the peasant's cottage? Would not such light things as thistle-down and smoke have to obey the impulse and go with the earth also? But they do not. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, If the atmosphere rushes forward from west to east continually, we are again obliged to conclude that whatever floats or is suspended in it at any altitude must of necessity partake of its eastward motion. A piece of cork or any other body floating in still water will be motionless, but let the water be put in motion in any direction whatever, and the floating bodies will move with it, in the same direction and with the same velocity. Let the experiment be tried in every possible way, and these results will invariably follow. Hence, if the Earth's atmosphere is in constant motion from west to east, all the different strata which are known to exist in it, and all the various kinds of clouds and vapors which float in it, must of mechanical necessity move rapidly eastwards. But what is the fact? If we fix upon any star as a standard or datum outside the visible atmosphere, we may sometimes observe a stratum of clouds going for hours together in a direction the very opposite to that in which the Earth is supposed to be moving. Not only may a stratum of clouds be seen moving rapidly from east to west, but at the same moment other strata may often be seen moving from north to south, or from south to north. It is a fact well known to aeronauts that several strata of atmospheric air are often moving in as many different directions at the same time. 
on almost any moonlit and cloudy night, different strata may be seen not only moving in different directions, but, at the same time, moving with different velocities, some floating past the face of the moon rapidly and uniformly, and others passing gently along, sometimes becoming stationary, then starting fitfully into motion, and often standing still for minutes together. In his book, South Sea Voyages, Arctic and Antarctic explorer Sir James Clark Ross described his experience on the night of November 27, 1839, and his conclusion that the Earth must be motionless. The sky being very clear, the planet Venus was seen near the zenith, notwithstanding the brightness of the meridian sun. It enabled us to observe the higher stratum of clouds to be moving in an exactly opposite direction to that of the wind, a circumstance which is frequently recorded in our meteorological journal, both in the northeast and southeast trades, and has also been observed by former voyagers. Captain Basil Hall witnessed it from the summit of the peak of Tenerife, and Count Strilecki, on ascending the volcanic mountain of Karenia in Oahi, reached at 4,000 feet an elevation above that of the trade wind, and experienced the influence of an opposite current of air of a different hygrometric and thermometric condition. Count Strzelecki further informed me of the following seemingly anomalous circumstance, that at the height of 6,000 feet he found the current of air blowing at right angles to both the lower strata, also of a different hydrometric and thermometric condition, but warmer than the inner stratum. Such a state of the atmosphere is compatible only with the fact which other evidence has demonstrated that the earth is at rest. William Carpenter wrote, It is a well-known fact that clouds are continually seen moving in all manner of direction. Yes, and frequently in different directions at the same time, from west to east being as frequent a direction as any other. Now if the earth were a globe revolving through space west to east at a rate of 19 miles in a second, the clouds appearing to us to move towards the east would have to move quicker than 19 miles in a second to be thus seen, whilst those which appear to be moving in the opposite direction would have no necessity to be moving at all, since the motion of the earth would be more than sufficient to cause that appearance. But it only takes a little common sense to show us that it is the clouds that move, just as they appear to do, and that therefore the earth is motionless. Heliocentrists believe the world beneath their feet is spinning at a mind-numbing 1,038 miles per hour at the equator, while perfectly pulling the entire atmosphere along for the ride. Meanwhile, at the mid-latitudes of USA and Europe, they believe the world and atmosphere spin around 900 to 700 miles per hour, decreasing gradually all the way down to zero miles per hour at the north and south poles, where the stagnant atmosphere apparently never moves, completely escaping the grips of gravity's magic velcro. This means, at all latitudes, every inch of the way, the atmosphere manages to perfectly coincide with the supposed speed of the Earth, compensating from zero miles per hour at the poles, all the way up to 1,038 miles per hour at the equator, and every speed in between. These are all lofty assumptions heliocentrists make without any experimental evidence to back them up. Marshall Hall said, in short, the sun, moon, and stars are actually doing precisely what everyone throughout all history has seen them do. We do not believe what our eyes tell us because we have been taught a counterfeit system which demands that we believe what has never been confirmed by observation and experiment. That counterfeit system demands that the earth rotate on an axis every 24 hours at a speed of over a thousand miles per hour at the equator. No one has ever, ever, ever seen or felt such movement nor seen or felt the 67,000 mile per hour speed of the Earth's alleged orbit around the Sun, or its 500,000 mile per hour alleged speed around a galaxy, or its retreat from an alleged Big Bang at over 670 million miles per hour. Remember, no experiment has ever shown the Earth to be moving. Add to that the fact that the alleged rotational speed we've all been taught as scientific fact must decrease every inch or mile one goes north or south of the equator, and it becomes readily apparent that such things as accurate as aerial bombing in World War II down a chimney from 25,000 feet with a plane going any direction at high speed would have been impossible if calculated on an Earth moving below at several hundred miles per hour and changing constantly with the latitude. Before heliocentric indoctrination, any child will look up to the sky and notice that the sun, moon, and stars all revolve around a stationary earth. 
All evidence from our perspective clearly demonstrates that we are fixed and the heavenly bodies circle around us. We feel the earth as motionless and observe the sun, moon, stars, and planets to be moving entities. To suspend this common sense geocentric perspective and assume that it is actually the earth rotating beneath us daily while revolving around the sun yearly is quite a theoretical leap to take without any empirical evidence to land on. Alan Daves said, Ignorant folk think that such minority opinions as geocentricism are conspiracy theories. There is a real conspiracy, for sure, but the sad thing is it is mostly a conspiracy of willful and apathetic ignorance, for numerous reasons. The very people who would call geocentrists quack conspiracy theorists are either themselves completely ignorant of even modern cosmological axioms and principles of gravitation and mechanics, or they are just playing stupid, hoping no one will notice or call their bluff. What's even more hilarious is the fact that even folk like Stephen Hawking and a few intellectually honest physicists and cosmologists who would read what we are saying and are capable of understanding it know that what we have been saying is absolutely true. Not only do they admit that, but even snicker about it to each other. But they won't dare to address that too openly with the dumb ignorant masses. Best not to confuse the common folk with unnecessary information and facts. Even more sad are all the others out there who don't have a clue what I'm saying here and shake their heads thinking they know something about physics that tells them that the earth moves. If only they studied the textbooks and peer-reviewed papers a little closer, they would realize just how absolutely ignorant with a capital I that argument really is.